The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following Diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Um, I think we've got a great lineup of talks and I'm hoping everybody's going to really enjoy what's going on. Um, but before we get started, I want to make sure to thank um, both Self for allowing us to take part in their event. So we're kind of a, a con inside of a con. Um, and I also want to make sure that I thank all of our sponsors because they were all very generous and came through in a big way to help us um, make this event a reality here in Charlotte. So um, I got a slide deck that I'm going to put up that's, that's going to eventually, that's going to have everybody's, um, you know, the, all the sponsors, websites and stuff like that. But um, Console Tech, FireEye, Gotham Digital Science, Impact Media, Qualys, Rapid7, and Wicked all came through in a major way to help us out. So a bunch of those vendors are out, some of those vendors are outside and have tables, so please stop in, pay them a visit, at least hear their spiel. Um, and uh, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, again, thanks everybody for coming. Hello, hello. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you for coming, and uh, to the organizers of uh, B-Sides Charlotte, thank you for having me. Uh, it's an honor to be the first speaker at the first ever B-Sides Charlotte. So today, we're, we're going to talk about malware automation. So can you guys hear me at the back? Sometimes I tend to speak uh, very softly. Uh, before we begin, let me introduce myself. Currently, I'm the principal malware scientist at RSA uh, NetWitness. Uh, we're based in Reston, Virginia, but I work from home in Atlanta, Georgia. So uh, I dedicated one of my rooms to be a lab. So during the winter time, I don't need to turn on my heater because it's already hot inside there. And uh, I'm the author of uh, Malware Rootkits and Botnets. It's been out since uh, August of last year. If you have uh, book budgets from your company, please get one. All the proceeds go directly to my kids' uh, 529 college fund. <laughs> Hopefully, they'll make it here today. They're, they're 10 minutes away. Uh, before joining RSA NetWitness, I was with Dambala for three years. I was their resident malware researcher and reverser. And before that, I was with uh, F-Secure. So uh, I was based in California when I was in F-Secure, but then they assigned me in Malaysia for uh, a year and a half to build and uh, lead their Asia R&D. And before that, I was with uh, Trend Micro. Uh, Trend Micro is where I started my career. Uh, I remember when they were trying to recruit me uh, when, I first, when I graduated from college, they didn't send me an email, they sent me a telegram. And uh, I should have kept that telegram. It, it would have been nice. And I was telling my son about the telegram, and he doesn't have any idea what a telegram is. <laughs> Even uh, when, my, when I had my first B-Sides shirt, it had a cassette tape there. He also had no idea what a cassette tape is. <laughs> and uh, you can follow me at Twitter. Send me a message. Uh, if you have questions, I'll be more than happy to help out. Uh, this is our team, RSA First Watch. Uh, it's a new team in RSA. It's, uh, it started last year. Uh, I think it was April. So uh, you can read what we do. I always describe it as the GI Joe of threat research. And uh, you can follow us at RSA First Watch. All right, on with the talk. 
So the purpose is to understand the tools and methods behind the staggering number of malware discovered on a periodic basis. So for us to achieve that purpose, we will be talking about uh, what we're up against and uh, what, the, what are the tools used by the attackers, how they combine those tools to achieve the staggering number of malware that we see every day, and why do they do it? What's the advantage for them of doing it? And then uh, I will show you a live demo of a real malware automation system. So if you guys have uh, AV vendors, uh, every year you probably get a report something like this. I usually term it as a horror story. It's a, it's a stat to horrify probably your CIO or CISO to buy their products. But when you look at it, at it deeper, it's actually true. There's so many malware that are coming out every day. I remember when I first started, uh, they would assign me probably five malware a day. But now, when you look at the queue, it's thousands and thousands and thousands. And sometimes you have to prioritize based on customers, whoever pays uh, the highest amount of money, and then you would always process their uh, malware problems first, or their malware cases first. So here you can see the jump. I think the average right now is, uh, I'm just guessing, I think it's around 55 to uh, 75,000 a day. But uh, I think we see millions in a year. But then again, when they define unique, the way they define unique is that if you get a file, you just add a small byte at the end of it, take a hash, even though it's the same thing, then they would define it already as unique. So before, this is what we are up against, uh, a lone wolf malware. So if there's going to be an outbreak, usually once you, once you get a sample of that malware, you create a solution for it, you deploy that solution, uh, that solution would actually stop the outbreak already because it covers everything about the malware because there's only one type of malware sample that's been out there. So SQL Slammer, Config are only one type. But now when it comes to attacks, they use different kinds of uh, malware families. So you're actually up against an army of armored malware. So even though you create a solution for one, because you were able to capture that from a customer system, when you deploy it, it doesn't mean that it'll stop the attack. Probably it'll stop the attack on that one piece of malware that probably you wouldn't see anymore. But then the rest, the 999,000 more, you won't be able to stop the attack. So what are the tools that attackers are using to achieve this? We have the DIY kits. We have the uh, armoring tools, uh, the packers, encryptors, joiners, and binders. And they also use AV scanners for quality assurance. So DIY kits. DIY kits, uh, they're not new. So you could actually, uh, the first one that I uh, actually touched early in my career is the one that's uh, created by uh, someone from Chicago. It's VCL, it's been around since 1992. Uh, you can still get a sample of this from the internet, just Google it. Uh, before when VX Heavens was still up, most of the old samples you could get from there. And not, not to be outdone, uh, another group, uh, the PSMPC, they also created their own DIY kit. So the main idea of these DIY kits is that it's very simple to create, uh, I mean, uh, to create a malware. You don't need to have assembly language skills or even uh, C uh, coding skills to create your own malware. All you need is just, uh, just need to know the command line, uh, commands, the options, type them, click enter, and then it would actually create the malware for you. So there's no need to have all of those skills that you need, that the malware attackers have to create your own malware. Fast forward 15, 20 years, we get SpyEye. And we also get Zeus. So uh, it makes it much more easier for these kids because here you just click and click and click and then you create your own malware sample. And uh, currently the DIY kits right now, 
especially if they're new, they're really very expensive. So for you to be able to get your hands on them, you have to have the budget, and then you have to have a trusted entity in the hacker underground. So when I say trusted entity, someone who's been, uh, you guys have eBay accounts, right? So a hacker underground is like a combination of an Amazon and eBay uh, site. So each kit or each uh, malware technology tool, they would have uh, ratings. They would have uh, five stars or rating of uh, one to 10. And then the sellers and buyers like eBay, they would also have their own rating because they wouldn't just sell it to anyone who they don't trust because uh, they would always think that some, some, some of that uh, people are probably from law enforcement or from other AV companies. So uh, to be able to get in, you, you must have an entity there that has been there for a long time. So usually it's a long process. Or you can always wait for somebody to leak it out in the internet. Like uh, what the tools I'll be uh, showing you in my demo later, they're all leaked out. So uh, if you know how to find them, uh, just use Google, you'd be able to find the kits. But my contract with my company prevents me from showing you how to find it. <laughs> <laughs> so the main idea of DIY kits is, uh, and I've mentioned this already, it's very easy to create malware. It, you have the power to create malware. You don't need to have the assembly language skills. And uh, DIY kits nowadays compared to DIY kits before is that they're more uh, potent. They're more dangerous, they're more armored, and uh, you can only get them for a, for a price. And the reason behind the rise of DIY kits now compared to before is that before, uh, when you have sponsors, sponsors like state entities, other companies, or individuals that want to attack another entity, uh, usually they would uh, converse directly with the malware writers. But it's easy to go, uh, it's easy to track the malware writers when it comes to that process. So what they did is instead of them uh, communicating directly to the sponsors, they would just create a kit and, and then they would just give them license or codes to unlock certain functionalities that the sponsor need. So if ever things go south, they're out of the picture. They, they will have the kit, but they won't have the people who actually wrote the kit. So the DIY kits themselves, themselves already have uh, armoring technology in them. So uh, the way it works is that it can create infinite amount of samples, infinite amount of unique samples. Now when I say unique here, uh, it's like a metamorphic. So metamorphic means it's different on disk. The way it appears on disk and the way it appears in memory, it's totally different. So if you're not familiar, with the kits and the samples they create, some AV researchers would actually think one sample is different from another sample, from another sample, from another sample. But when in fact, it only came from a, a single kit. So it, it can create infinite amount of unique malware samples because it uses time and date as a seed. So as long as time exists, it would create uh, a unique sample. Now hackers, or, uh, I should say attackers, because not all hackers are bad. I think it's a misnomer. Mm. They don't rely on the armoring tools of kits uh, all the time. They also utilize uh, armoring tools. So the most common armoring tools are uh, packers. So one of them are UPX, uh, PE Lite, uh, Themida. Some of them are third party uh, legitimate software. And that prevents us from reverse engineering it because once we reverse engineer a third party uh, encryption software or a packer that's for legitimate software purposes, then we're violating their EULA. So it's a sticky situation. But if it's a tool that is uh, from the underground, it's, we can reverse it anytime without the fear of uh, being sued. Now the main idea of armoring tools is that they could have different packaging of this, but then when you look at the codes that they attach or the way they encrypt the samples, the way they do it is that uh, the source code in, it, in itself, some of them are the same. So it's either they steal from other uh, AV writer, I mean uh, malware writers, 
or they get leaked codes and then repackage it as their own. And the exciting part about most of these tools is that they would have different options. Like here it says uh, additional options. But then some of them, when you try them out, and then when you check them, some of them don't work. So uh, I'm not so sure, probably because the license that they would grant you would only uh, activate specific uh, functions, or probably just doesn't work. They would add it there. They would say, OK, we have all of these features, but in fact, none of them work. And the, and, the, and the good thing about having all of these tools and all of these uh, kits is that you can have a, uh, let's say, I, I call it a pawn EXE. So it's an executable that I know uh, inside and out. And then I apply all of these armoring tools. And whatever changes that has been done to that executable, then those are the things I try to reverse and find out what they added to that executable. And not all armoring tools are, uh, are tools that you can run in your system. Some of them are offered online. This is one thing I found, uh, this is one I found in detectables.net. When I was doing my experiment on this, this was free. So you can upload all of your creations here. But of course, uh, whoever owns this site means they get a copy of whatever you upload to them. And that copy, they could actually sell it in the underground. So if you have a kit, if you want to sell samples, you can create samples. You, can, you could uh, sell one unique sample in the underground for one cent. So if you have uh, 100, that's a dollar. If you have uh, 1,000, that's $10. And later I'll show you how possible it is to create a million samples just by not doing anything, just clicking uh, some buttons, and then you can relax and then just look at the samples being created. Oh, and right now this, you cannot access it for free anymore. You need to get a uh, code to access this. But I haven't checked it yet before I came here. Uh, but the last time I checked, it's not free anymore. So this is one, uh, this is one of my favorite joiners. Uh, they're also called binders. So before, the infection routine is built into the malware. Because mo most of the malware we see they're called computer viruses before, they attach themselves to files. And if you infect a file that's enticing, chances are that file would be executed and the system in which that file has been executed on would get infected. But right now, since uh, creating infection routine is a dying art, what the, hacker, what the attackers did is that they created tools that would actually attach a malicious file to a benign file. So it's like they made the infection routine into a tool. So the main advantage of this is that you can get any popular app or any popular program today and then just attach your creation to that popular file and then spread it. You can spam it. You can uh, post it in free websites, uh, free uh, file hosting sites, or you could just install a peer-to-peer uh, -peer file sharing program in your system and then share it there. So uh, when this first came out, the solutions that were uh, thought of by software publishers is that every time they would post something in their website, a program, they would put the hash there of the program so that uh, you would be ensured that what you're downloading is the one that came from the publisher. But of course, if, you, if you're able to compromise the website, you can always uh, change the MD5 or the SHA-1 hash that they post there. So this is uh, the same as what I've uh, mentioned. It's called the EXE bundle. So as I've mentioned before, the main idea there is that uh, they would have different GUI. They would have different uh, functionality. But still, it's the same thing. Oh, by the way, guys, if you buy the, the book, you'll send those two kids to college. So please get a copy of, uh, of the book. So when you attack someone, uh, you want to make sure that your creation would be able to get into the system. So uh, one of the tools they use are AV scanners. Of course, there are other uh, security products out there so uh, they, only, they not only test it against AV scanners, they also test it against like firewall, 
and uh, whatever security products that uh, are very popular out there right now. But when it comes to AV scanners, this is the one that's most popular with attackers. So it's, it's in-house. You could install it in your system. I mean, it's on-premise. You could install it in your system. And the way it works is that uh, this would actually modify the engines of the AV products that are supported. So when I say modify the engines, it means that they can run multiple products in one system without actually killing the other AV vendor that's installed. But there's a disadvantage to this uh, implementation because sometimes when they actually modify a certain DLL of an AV product, whatever functionality, let's say a dynamic scanning functionality for that product, sometimes they kill it. So it's not as effective. So what they do to fix it is that they would just have different uh, VM implementations and then they would install the most popular AV products there and then they would run their creation there. But if they don't have this tool and they, and then they, and they don't have any budget, they could always use an online uh, scanning tool. So the most popular for research, uh, with researchers is VirusTotal. Before, attackers use it, but then they found out that uh, if you upload the sample there, it gets distributed to AV companies, so it, it uh, kills the purpose. But some of them, they still take advantage of it because what happens is that those samples that get uh, distributed to the AV companies, given that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of samples that AV companies uh, uh, receive, they go to the bottom of the queue. So let's say if you receive 10,000 samples today, that would be 10,000, that would be in 10,001 queue. So chances are of it being processed, probably it'll take them like a week or even months. So some of them still take advantage of uh, using virus total. But the most popular one is uh, no virus tanks. This is one, there, there are more. Because this one has the option that says, uh, do not distribute with AV companies. But of course, you're not sure whether they're really distributing it or not. Now, how do they combine these tools? So first, you, you have the DIY kit malware. It produces samples. And then it, it goes through different armoring tools. So you could apply different armoring tools many times to, to your creation. Now, the difference with this method compared to the method uh, that uh, we've been seeing in the early 90s is that before, computing power is not cheap. So every time you do modification in your creation, it takes a lot of computing, uh, computing power and also memory, and it slows down the system. But now, since uh, most of the computers we see are very powerful, the, the CPUs are faster, RAM is cheap, the attackers don't mind putting lots of uh, armoring in their uh, creation to actually protect them from being uh, discovered. Now, once they create their armored malware, then they would conduct uh, quality assurance. And that is, they would check it against different uh, security products to determine whether it's detected or not. Now, if, if, if this is an APT and uh, they want to attack a certain company, uh, the first thing they would do is that they would find out what that company is using to protect themselves. Now, most of those information, you don't need to have sophisticated uh, hacking skills. Sometimes you just need to go to job posting boards, especially if they have an opening for an admin job because sometimes all of the information are there. They say you have, to be a, you have to be an expert in this OS, you have to be an expert in managing this uh, security product and all that. So they're able to determine what's protecting that company. And sometimes, let's say it's using AV vendor A and then they tested it. It's detected by AV vendor C and B, but it's not detected by AV vendor A. They would still conduct the attack. And anyway, given that they're able to create malware in seconds, they don't mind that certain malware being captured because they could just change it to another one that's purely undetected, which I will explain later. And another thing where they get this information is uh, they also get it from uh, technical exchange uh, forums because some people would actually use their real email address in those forums. Now, those that are smart enough to not use their real email address or their company email address. Some of them 
when they copy paste a message from somebody within the company, sometimes they forget to remove the signature that contains the company name. So uh, getting all of this information is uh, very easy. Again, Google is a very nice tool. You just need to Google. So after this, they're able to create their army of armored malware. Now DIY kit is not only the source of samples, because sometimes it's hard to get your hands on uh, DIY kits. So what you can do is that you could uh, use old malware. So I usually, I had, I had a talk before I demonstrated this, I called it uh, the green malware made from 100% recycled malware. It, you just run it in, the tool, uh, in different arming tools and that malware would become undetected again. So there, there has been cases uh, that I've seen that they would say they've been attacked by a very sophisticated malware. But then when you peel that malware, you, you remove all the armoring, that sample is five years old. So it's just new and sophisticated because they got attacked by it. But then when you peel all of the armoring, you find out that it's, uh, it's an old malware. And it's easy to get uh, old malware, uh, especially most of you, probably all of your technical guys. Uh, I'm guessing uh, you get late night calls from your relatives who have problems with their PC. And then when you go to that PC, remote control it, you'll actually see different files. And then when you look at those files, those files are already infected with uh, some sort of malware. And those are good source of malware. So why do they do it? Exponential effect, strength in numbers, easy malware update, and uh, to knock AV out. Now let's go to the exponential effect. So as I've mentioned before, with the malware DIY kits, you can create infinite amount of uh, unique malware samples. As long as time exists, you can create a unique malware sample. And the way they create unique samples that they, they just don't add bytes to get a different hash, it's metamorphic. So uh, what you see on disk and what you see on memory, it's totally different from each sample. And then you, let's say you run one sample against one armoring tool. So you get a variation of that sample. And then you run it against another armoring tool. And then you do it and so on and so on and so forth. So you get infinite, virtually infinite amount of uh, malware samples. As I, and as I, as I have said, you could actually sell one sample, one cent in the underground. So this is a good money-making scheme. So you just need to have a bare metal system and a free VM license, and then you can create this. But again, my contract forbids me to, uh, to tell you how to exactly do it, but I'll show you how it works. Easy malware update. So unique samples per malware deployment technology. So when, when an attack is conducted, the attackers use different uh, deployment technology. The most popular is email, drive-by download sites, and uh, USB. So if you see some people in front of your office giving out free USBs, and then uh, you plug it in your system, and you have uh, auto-run enable enabled in your system, chances are you'll get infected. So USB is still being used uh, to be a to deploy malware. And I think there were some cases a couple of years back, or probably five years ago, wherein uh, people would get uh, disks and USBs from conferences, and then those USBs would turn out to be uh, carrying malware. So in a threat ecosystem, the threat ecosystem is made up of different parts. Actually, there are two major components, the human element and the technical element. So the human element, they're the sponsors, they're the malware writers, they're the people behind the threat ecosystem. And the threat ecosystem, the technical elements, one of the, one of the parts there is the deployment technology. So the deployment technology is owned by somebody else. It's not owned by the sponsor. It's not owned by the uh, malware writers. So what happens there is that taking a, a spam email, for example, usually each email spam would contain a unique malware sample. So if you're company A, you get bombarded by 
a spam email and you find and you find out that it's a uh, it's infected and you forward it to your uh, AV vendor or their security vendor and then they would probably after a couple of days they would come back to you okay we have we now have a solution for this deploy it in your system you're happy you deploy it and then you'll you'll call them again saying nothing's happening but then when I tested it in the uh, against the sample I've sent it to you it gets detected but still information is getting uh, uh, stolen from my systems. The reality there is that because that sample that you've received, you won't see it ever again. Because each deployment spam would, have, would contain one unique sample. So that's why when we communicate with each other, uh, using MD5 to identify a sample is not really effective. Because that MD5, you won't see it ever again. You'll just see it in that one email. So the, the security uh, vendor, they actually solved the problem of detecting that one sample out of 100,000 samples that's being used for that one specific attack. And another thing about uh, updating malware is that malware serving domains can rotate malware in minutes. So, uh, in a botnet infrastructure, so botnets use uh, different kinds of uh, network infrastructure, and one of them is the malware serving domain. So the malware serving domain is different from a CNC uh, in a way that the CNC, whatever you put in a CNC in that channel, it would actually influence the behavior of the malware in the system. But when it comes to malware serving domains, the malware ser serving domain is the one that hosts updates. It hosts the malware updates, it hosts uh, configuration files, it hosts whatever files that the malware needs. So here, if the one in your system gets captured and then sent to your AV product, they'd probably, uh, they'd probably spend a couple of hours on it a day and then they'll de deploy the solution. But then if the attacker would actually uh, have a rule in that attack that says every six minutes, every hour, update that malware sample in that system. So even though they captured that one malware sample, if it gets updated with another one, uh, if you deploy that technology, it won't stop the attack. So it would, stop, it, it would detect that one piece of malware that doesn't exist anymore in your system because it's already updated. So the attackers could actually say, update that malware creation, uh, let's say every 3 a.m. so that uh, nobody would notice or uh, every hour. If they're really bold enough, they could probably say every minute, but then it would have lots of uh, noise. It, you, if, you have lo if you have logging mechanisms in your network, that would be very easy to spot. And uh, knock AV out. This is, uh, everybody knows this already. So malware creation time versus solution cycle time. So malware creation time, I would show you later, it just takes seconds to create a malware. But once you create that, but solution cycle time, that's the time wherein uh, the AV researchers get the malware sample and then they create a solution for it. I remember when I was in Trend Micro, our fastest is two hours. Our promise is always two hours, especially if you're a high paying customer. And if we're not able to solve that malware sample, we give you back your money. Now that only, uh, that's only detection. It doesn't include uh, cleanup because Malware today, they're, so, they're sophisticated that they embed themselves deep into the operating system that removing the malware would actually uh, destroy the operating system. So uh, it's like an alien, right? So it attaches itself to the human host. So once you remove that alien from the human host, if you're watching Falling Skies, I think, uh, I think June 9th is uh, the second season. Once you remove that alien from the human host, chances are the human host would die. It's the same thing with the operating system, especially if the malware is complicated enough to embed itself in the operating system. And given the tools that are available to the attackers today, most AV evasion techniques are effectively utilized. So unlike before, you have to go to a certain group of malware writers that are experts in hiding their creations or in using a certain uh, AV technology to be able to utilize that technology. But now, 
you could actually just buy a tool or use a leaked one, or if you're a hobbyist, uh, modify the codes in those tools. And then you could actually learn how, to, how most of those malware technology work. So you don't need to communicate to somebody who's, very, who's an expert in a certain malware technology. All of those technology are now in your hands. So most of the attackers, they can effectively utilize most of those uh, AV evasion techniques. And since most of the creation, they're metamorphic, when it comes to creating signatures for them, especially if the AV vendors or security vendors are using an automated system, even their signature creation right now, it's automated. So what happens it, it, is that it becomes a one is to one. So if an attack contains 100,000 unique samples, that's 100,000 unique uh, signatures from the AV company. And of course, that won't scale. So if you have updates that's more than five meg, ask your AV uh, provider or your security provider questions like, how do you approach this problem of malware kits? How do you differentiate a creation of one kit from another? And how do you differentiate an armored uh, malware from another armored malware using different kinds of tools? So those are very good questions to ask, especially if you're going to meet with your uh, security providers. And understanding the malware, because if you really want to go to the root of things to understand what's going on, you really have to reverse it. Now for me, it, uh, standing here in front of you, it's very easy to say, oh, just reverse this, reverse that, reverse this, and then you'll find out. But in reality, reversing takes a lot of time. Like I could get a sample, I could, uh, I could probably reverse it in an hour it, if it's really, really, really easy. But if it's an average malware, sometimes it takes me days, weeks, even months, de depending on the difficulty. And sometimes I cannot do it alone. I need to ask the help of other researchers to help me uh, reverse it. And imagine if you do that per one malware sample that the attackers would uh, actually uh, deploy, it won't scale. So it would take you, let's say, if we're very optimistic, one malware sample to reverse a day, and it creates the, uh, and it, it takes them one second to create one, it, it just doesn't make sense. All right, let's go see the demo. So in this uh, specific demo, we would be using uh, Zeus. So this is running in a uh, slow motion. In reality, it could be faster. So this one represents the number of malware that's being created right now. So that's unique malware. Not unique as defined by security uh, providers. We're in different hashes. This is unique in a way that it's different in the disk and also in memory. So it's a metamorphic unique. See, now we have eight. We have nine. So if you're the attacker, you could be in jail. You could send a Twitter message to, uh, let's say, uh, using uh, a Twitter account that you've specially set up to control this, and you would be able to activate this. So uh, I had a talk, I think it was a couple of years ago, it's uh, follow my botnet in Twitter. I've demonstrated it there, how you can use Twitter to actually control systems like this and any malware that you would have on your system. So same concept applies here. So you just turn this on, you can go out for a lunch break, go watch a movie, line up for Superman, and then when you come back, this would be in the thousands. By the way, this system is set up for educational purposes only. I cannot take out any of the samples out of here. After this, all of the samples would be destroyed. I have to say that for the camera. <laughs> So that's Zeus, 
And now I will show you how, how we automate armoring. So that one is showing how to create malware using DIY kits in an automated fashion, even if it's a UI-based DIY kit. So while, while I was talking, we were able to create uh, 36 malware samples. Even if you go on a bio break, when you come back, you'll probably have hundreds of samples in your system. So in this demo, we would use a saw. So as you can see here, a saw has different options. It has different kinds of uh, anti-sandboxing technologies. Some of, these technologi some of these technologies, they work when I tried it. Some of them didn't. I'm not so sure if my experiment is uh, the one that has a problem. But uh, if you get tools like this, don't, the main lesson here is that uh, don't believe whatever you see in the options or in the, in the feature list. Because chances are, some of them, they don't work. They just put it there to convince uh, newbies or buying this that they, they would have their creation protected or have those malware technology applied to their creation. So this is getting one, one of that, one creation that we did using our uh, sandbox. So that's just one malware sample and then out of that, you could create this. And this specific tool, it doesn't use date and time to encrypt the malware as a seed. It actually uses a random character, so a random string. Now this one, you can randomize the string, but in the, in the 80s and early 90s, the way this works is that those string characters, you actually get it from the executable itself on a specific location. But uh, as I mentioned, most of those uh, functionalities are now automated. D did I see someone raise their hand? Oh. So while I was talking, we were able to create 10 armored malware. And again, those are unique. So the malware, the created malware is already unique to begin with. And then you make them more unique, plus you add more armoring to it. And if the malware and if the AV researchers don't have access to the kit, it's hard for them to understand especially if they only have the samples, what that sample is doing or what's going on with that sample. Probably when they reverse it, just reversing the armor part would take them a couple of days and then reversing the encryption provided by the DIY kit another couple of days and then to find out the real functionality of that malware would take them another, let's say, couple of days. But I'm being optimistic saying couple of days. In reality, sometimes it takes weeks. So if you, if you hear someone telling you, oh, I, I was able to reverse that in a couple of days, chances are he didn't. Probably just read the blog in the internet somewhere and is able to pass it off like, oh, this is my findings. But actually he just read it somewhere and, say, and he said, oh yeah, this is how it works. So that's how easy it is and So how does it work in a system? How, it is, how do they really implement it? It's actually very cheap for the malware writers. You just need a bare metal system, any cheap bare metal system uh, that can host uh, multiple VM images. You could have one VM image for your uh, DIY kit, and then another image for your tools, armoring tools. You could have different multiple images de depending on your need. You could even have an image for your AV scanners. So the good thing about this is that you could utilize uh, shared folders between the host and the guest. And that uh, shared folder, you could drop all of your creation there. And you could have an agent or a script running 
in the bare metal system that monitors if that directory is filled with something, and then if it is, you just pass it to the armoring tool image so it gets processed, and then you will get assist, and then just drop everything in one folder that have all the armored samples. And then just sit back, relax, <laughs> wait for your samples. So you could, you could go out, watch your kid's baseball game, watch a movie, and then come back and you will have tons and tons of samples. See how relaxed he is, how easy it is for him to create an army of armored malware. So that's it. Uh, that's my talk for the day. If you have any questions, please feel free to ask them. Yep. Sir, uh, can you describe some of the tools that you need to reverse? Huh. So uh, for each, for each uh, reverser, there's different techniques. But for me, what I do is that uh, I don't reverse it immediately. I run it first in a, in a uh, sandbox. So I run it in a virtualized sandbox. If nothing happens, then I go to a bare metal sandbox. And then if nothing happens, that's when I actually uh, put it in my own malware test environment. It's a bare metal system that uh, it's not automated wherein it doesn't have a time limit to run the malware in, let's say, in just 30 seconds or uh, three minutes. So there I would just let it run I would uh, use uh, different monitoring tools. Uh, SysInternals is a good source. And then uh, monitor the network and see. So uh, there's this one tool that I've used before. You just plug it in. Instead of installing Wireshark in your system, because some malware would actually detect whether Wireshark is running, and they won't do anything. And it's able to get all the packets that you need. So uh, if I get all the information from there, then I would stop. Because then, uh, from then, from all of those information, I could describe what the malware is doing and what kind of information is, uh, is the malware stealing out. Now, let's say none of those work. Then that's the time I would uh, reverse the malware. So what I would do is that I usually have two screens. So one screen would have the decompiled or disassembled code using IDA, and another screen uh, that's active wherein I'm debugging the malware. So the way I debug the malware is that uh, actually the, the screen with the disassembled code is my guide. So I'm making sure that whatever code it says here, that's the actual code the debugger is uh, going to. Now sometimes what happens is that it's totally different. And then what I will do, I would Google, look at different uh, things that other researchers have done. And sometimes, especially if the malware is old, there would already be plugins available, especially if you're using uh, Oli Debug. And those plugins would make life easier for you because they would, some of them would actually solve the encryption already. You just uh, put that plug in, activate it, and then all of that uh, would be taken away, all of, the, uh, all of the armoring stuff would be taken away, and then you would be left with, uh, with the code, and then you could follow it again. So. Uh, even though I reverse malware for a living, when it comes to reversing, if you could get all the information you can without reversing the malware, then that's it. Because malware, when you look at it, it's so complicated, and it, it doesn't make sense to, to, to spend that much time on other functionality when, in fact, you've already uncovered the, the main directive, the main functionality that the malware needs to conduct its attack. So hopefully I was able to answer your question. Okay. Uh, since you have experience with this business for a long time, uh, what trends have you seen that act actively worry you? Like you see something new that's like, wow, I haven't seen this before, or this is really bad. Uh, for me, if I see something new, it actually gets me excited. Because number one, it's new. It's a chance for me to learn something as well. Like most of the things that I've learned when it comes to malware technology, I didn't learn it from the company, the, from the companies that employed me. I actually learned it from the malware themselves. Now what worries me is that most security vendors, even though their research group or their technical group is aware of this, there's nothing they can do. Be especially if it doesn't sell, uh, like research, uh, in a company, research doesn't have that ROI 
compared to other departments in the company. So when you ask for budget about something, especially if you want to pursue a certain research, because you found out that we need a new kind of a solution, a solution, a new cutting edge solution to solve this, but then it would require research time. Sometimes even the manpower to do that research, let's say I would like to allocate one month of my time just to research that thing, sometimes it won't be uh, approved because then there would be lots of uh, firefighting going on for me to, uh, to take care of. Now that worries me because the malware writers, they're not waiting for us to do something about it. They're actually happy with us not doing anything about it because there's so many uh, hindrances when it comes to the bad guys. Unlike for them, a teenager in a basement in Europe, he could come up with a malware technology, post it in a forum, and then I have someone contact him and uh, probably say, okay, don't make this into a tool, work directly with us. We'll pay you $100,000 per technology that you produce for us. Now for them, it's very easy. But for us, it's not as easy because you have to go to different uh, things. So that's the only thing that worries me. In the industry, all of the technical people you talk with, even those working in the AV vendors, they're aware of the problem. But then doing something about it, there are lots of hindrances within the company. That's good, that's good. Oh yeah, yeah. E yep. Even before those companies came into existence, malware already has the technology to detect whether it's running in some sort of a virtualized environment. Even if you try to hide the fact that it's running in a virtualized environment, there would still be telltale signs that it's running in a virtualized environment. So that's why reversing those types of malware is fun, because you get to to learn things that uh, let's say, oh, I didn't know that. Uh, even though if I change this, this certain memory location would still have these kinds of strings and flags that would say I'm running in a virtualized environment. And the danger about those kinds of solutions is that sometimes they work on a timed basis. Let's say it's only 30 seconds, only one minute, only three minutes. If I'm a malware who wants to attack somebody who's using those kinds of solutions, I could just tell my malware, the, uh, my deployment technology, which is totally different from the malware that's being delivered. It's a, it, I have a discussion of that in my book. So uh, that certain malware, I could set it up in a way, do not do anything after one hour or after two hours or after three hours. And if you do something after an hour, why not connect to this website first uh, to check whether you're connected to the internet? Connect to this benign site, connect to this benign site, and then, try, and then that's the only time you would try to do whatever it is you need to do. Probably after an hour, that's the time it would uh, set up its persistency. When I say set up its persistency, uh, make sure that it would stay alive even after the servers or uh, systems have been uh, rebooted or have been shut down. So if you're running a sandbox environment, chances are it would only detect the behavior of the deployment technology, the dropper or the downloader and it would not detect the actual uh, malware uh, that's being installed in your system. By the way, a dropper and a downloader, they're different from the malware because they just carry the malware with them. So the difference between a dropper and a downloader is that a dropper has the malware in it already, so once you run it in your system, it would install the malware. Now the downloader, it's much more smaller, usually it's less than one meg sometimes like 300 kilobytes. That thing would need a malware serving domain to actually download uh, the actual malware that it would install. And most of these solutions, they only take, even though they say we cover the first stage, second stage, third stage, fourth stage, now the next question to ask them, what if the malware has a delaying mechanism? What if the malware has a timing mechanism? What if the malware uses variables that are only found in certain systems that uh, you cannot find in a virtualized environment. So those are the things that uh, you need to ask them. Now, the people working in those companies, uh, the 
companies you mentioned, they're smart and they know these problems. But then again, as I'm saying, there's lots of uh, hindrances within the company to pursue research that would actually create a cutting edge solution for these problems. Any more questions? Violent reactions? Or <laughs> if not, then that's it. Again, to the B-Sides uh, organizers, thank you for inviting me. It's an honor to be the first speaker and the first ever B-Sides Charlotte. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy to implement, easy to use, strong authentication. From Wicked. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the uh, you know of the community and, and the speed at which these uh, these you know these these deficiencies these bugs are getting discovered and, and fixed is a, I think that really shows the power of the you know of the open source community. It is global, and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think when you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You'll have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Is, uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle number one that mass scale number two it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens uh, in large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. 
High availability is a key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support. Uh, different network models. You can pick up whatever suits you better. Cloudstack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using Cloudstack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers. Then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. Cloudstack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think Cloud Stack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the Cloud Stack. When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones it extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astros based systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Astros or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Astros. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Astris, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? 
Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.